All right. Uh, a final renal case. This is one that you don't see too often. Again, it rarely gets to this point, I think, um, at least in this country. But certainly in third world countries, you'll see this all the time because the women are multiparous and uh, obviously have no access to the kind of care that would be required to fix it. So this is a severe case of pelvic floor descent. This patient, female patient, comes in with giant bilateral hydronephrosis. So, of course, we're thinking bladder tumor. If it had been a male, maybe prostate will uh, present this way. But when you look down lower, look at the size of the ureters on their way down, pretty significantly enlarged. And down here, what you're looking at is actually the bladder pinching together through a, a relatively large hole in the pelvic floor and then you'll see it bulging back out inferior to that. So this is actually a collapsed bladder squeezing through the gap in the pelvic floor. There's also small bowel associated with this, what's known as an enterocele, and that is a particular concern to the surgeons. When they go to fix this, uh, one of the big considerations they have is, uh, is there going to be small bowel present? If there's small bowel in this herniation, they're going to be much more inclined to take that patient to surgery. So here is the bladder that has squeezed through that gap, and then there's a significant amount of bowel in the more posterior portion. So it's amazing to see the bladder squeeze through. There's a little above the pelvic floor right there. And then you see it narrow down and then bulge back out. Right? And then this time followed the small bowel through. So this again is the uh, consequence of multiparity. Uh, so many children passing through there over the years is going to tend to loosen the pelvic floor. And then ultimately, obviously, structures can herniate down through that, down in between the patient's legs. So there's small bowel and bladder there. Again, they call that an enterocele and is definitely of surgical note. All right, that is an extreme case of pelvic floor descent. Okay, this is another uh, kind of pediatric case, certainly adolescent case. This is hematometricolpo, so an imperforate hymen has resulted in the retention, probably over several months, of menstrual flow. So there is uterine and vaginal distension. That was the uterus, and this is the vagina. Pretty impressive how dilated this can get over a few months of menstruation. So there's the uterus. The uterus always dilates a little less than the vagina. Obviously, the vagina has to reach practically its maximum capacity before the uterus, which is obviously more thick-walled, uh, will start to dilate up. So you'll appreciate that on the sagittal. It always looks like a, a little mildly enlarged uterus perched on top of this big distended vagina. I couldn't find a cut that actually helped us appreciate the imperfect hymen perfectly, the lower edge of the scan just catches it here on the sagittal. So if you look at the very bottom of the screen, uh, you can see a little soft tissue density going across the bottom. That's the imperforate hymen that led to all this. So there's that little uterus. This one is actually uh, one of the most distended uh, uteri that I have seen in this condition. Uh, so it's always much less uh, impressive than that giant dilated vagina. And again, you actually can just appreciate skimming the bottom of the scan, that imperforate hymen that led to all this. All right, so that is hematometrial colpos. So this is a tubo ovarian abscess. And I think the important thing to learn from this is spotting dilated tubes. So they're often oriented anterior, posterior. The other thing is they get markedly tortuous when they, are when they are obstructed and begin to dilate up. So those are the two things to help you when you see a tubular hypodense structure in the female pelvis, of course, think 
of tubo ovarian abscess. So there is a dilated and thick walled tube on the left here. There is a fluid collection in the left adnexa. The interesting thing is those are not always ovarian. Many times the distal aspect of the fallopian tube, it's normally larger and it will distend up much more relatively than the rest of the tube. So you can see a big bulbous thing at the end of a dilated tube. It may just be more tube and not necessarily an ovarian abscess. So we have bilateral adnexal fluid collections in this case. And here is the gigantic dilated tube on the right. And you can see again, a huge dilated distal aspect. That's probably just tube. That's probably just the, uh, the, the very distal portion of the tube that tends to be larger. You can see there is also some debris layering in there, hoping to coach you guys up on spotting levels like that, debris levels, hematocrit levels. It can be really helpful, or air fluid levels for that matter. All right, a lot of inflammatory change in the pelvis itself, bilateral ovarian fluid collections, and bilateral tubal dilation, that left one being a lot trickier to see than that obvious right one. You can see how tortuous and dilated that right tube has become. So in this sorting out what is distal tube and what is ovarian fluid collection can be tricky. And just calling this bilateral tubo ovarian abscesses is probably your best bet. Okay, so here is the fooler. This is something to always keep on your differential when you're calling something a tubo ovarian abscess. So we've got similar conditions here. We've got bilateral dilated tubes. And this one is really nice because it looks like just a chain of fluid collections, right? But what that really is, is a corkscrew uh, dilated tube on the right. And there's a little tubal dilation on the left as well. So this one I called an adnexal fluid collection. I actually happen to know that because we did an MR on this patient. All right, now here is the thing that really tipped me in initially looking at this case, because I actually made this call. Uh, this is one from years ago in my private practice. But the small bowel is all stuck together. And when you see that kind of tethering, certainly, I hope you're thinking Crohn disease, right? Because that does happen in Crohn disease. But we've got the dilated tube. So in the setting of a dilated tube, bowel tethering like this, it says to me endometriosis. Endometriosis will implant on the serosal aspects of the gut and will cause an inflammatory reaction that draws in other bowel loops and makes them very sticky. Uh, and causes them all to cicatrize down into a central point. So it does look a lot like Crohn disease, and certainly you can have a little of this phenomenon in a, just a generic tubo-ovarian abscess, right? There can be enough pelvic inflammation or infection to cause this kind of adhesion. But this is a, a pretty dramatic case, and uh, it really struck me. And in addition, there's some hypodense collections both in the cul-de-sac and immediately adjacent to the rectum. And of course, that could be additional pelvic abscesses, but taking all of this into account, I said, I think this is endometriosis. So we did a, an MR and got all kinds of GRE signal all over the place uh, denoting blood products. So this was a case of endometriosis. Again, there are a lot of nonspecific findings that you can put together and appreciate here that right tube where you can see that those apparent, that apparent chain of fluid collections is really a corkscrewing, markedly dilated right tube. So here's that tube. You can see it really is all contiguous. And then that right ovarian fluid collection turned out to be an endometrioma, of course. There again, on the rectum and in the cul-de-sac, additional collections. So, okay, the funny thing about this is when I said, this is endometriosis, I remember a bunch of my private practice partners saying, 
you can't say that. You can't tell the difference between a TOA and endometriosis. I said, oh, look at all this stuff. And so when I was proven right here, I strutted about for a long time. And whenever I heard anyone say, you can't tell a tubo ovarian abscess from endometriosis on a CT, I would roll my eyes and think, well, I can. And I was wrong in making that distinction on like the next three or four cases of this, of one or the other that I saw. So ultimately, no, you really can't. I'm willing to admit that now. You cannot reliably tell the difference between a TOA and endometriosis. It just so happens this one uh, fit together very nicely. I was in the right place at the right time with the right thought in my head, uh, but uh, it's not something I would count on. All right, uh, this is just a neat case. It's a corneal ectopic. So this is the gestational sac, pretty thick walled and vascular, but you can see there's essentially a claw sign of the uterus. You don't have myometrium, wrapping all the way around the gestational sac. And just like on ultrasound, you need to see a rim of myometrium surrounding any gestational sac so that you can be sure it's not a corneal ectopic. And these are the particular da particularly dangerous ones, right? If you are going to die from hemoperitoneum and hypotension due to a ruptured ectopic, these ones are disproportionately to blame. They're not a common location for ectopics, but when you have one, the likelihood of this leading to hemorrhage and death is much greater than ectopics located anywhere else. All right, and there is the extravasation. It's funny about extravasation. Uh, when you have arterial pressure or extravasation that's pumping into a large area of partially formed clot, it can actually just run like a channel. I think we saw this in the aortic dissection case that was bleeding into the pericardium. And you'll see that here. It actually looks like a bizarre giant aberrant vessel. See that tubular contrast collection coming right there from the corneal region. And it's impressive on the coronal as well. But let's look at this one uh, one more time. So there's just massive hemoperitoneum Clot is forming, it's probably kind of soft, so pulsatal arterial bleeding can just drive a channel through it and then continue to pump blood through that channel thus created, right? So that's what causes this phenomenon, and it can look really weird. You can confuse active extravasation for a vessel. It's not that hard to do. Okay, let's look one more time at focusing on the uterus and the fact that there is no myometrium extending completely around that gestational sac. It's essentially a uterine claw sign there. Right? And that's the important thing to note. All right, here it is on the coronal. Again, that claw sign is readily apparent and you can locate it more easily in the right corneal region of the uterus on the coronals as well. And you'll see that same phenomenon, right? That uh, vessel mimicry of active extravasation into a clot-filled peritoneum. So that is a ruptured corneal ectopic. Uh, in my medical malpractice evaluation of a large number of medical malpractice cases over many years, and I'll show you those cases, we're gonna do medical malpractice uh, in October. But in that, I came to the conclusion that there are three giant risks, all right? And they are aortic dissection, spinal epidural abscess, and superior mesenteric artery occlusion or ischemic bowel. So those are the three biggest risks. But coming in just under those entities in the rankings was corneal ectopic. Uh, this resulted in uh, more deaths and more medical malpractice indemnity than almost any other pathologies aside from my uh, big three. So it's one that can have devastating consequences and that you have to always be on the lookout for. And you can see it in any modality, right? You can pick it up on ultrasound, CT, and certainly on MR as well. All right, a couple cases of ovarian torsion. So. This is one that has dropped down into the cul-de-sac 
And these can be in almost any location. So in the cul-de-sac is common, also pressed up against the anterior abdominal wall. You'll see it both ways. So you've got a hypodense pelvic mass, but look at those little peripheralized hypodense follicles. And that is the key thing. When you spot that, then you know what you're looking at is a torus ovary, right? Because it can otherwise be pretty confusing depending on the degree of ischemia and the time course, these things can get very hypodense and look uh, distinctly non-ovarian, right? But those peripheralized follicles are always gonna help you say, hey, I'm looking at an ovary. And you can see them all throughout. They're not just on that one cut I chose. All right, so that is an ovarian torsion in the cul-de-sac. That call was made on a non-contrast scan. Not bad. Not my case. All right, here is another ovarian torsion. And this one embodies a phenomenon that I really want you to look out for. And that is that many torus ovaries are associated with a large ovarian cyst. And the simple reason is this acts like a pawl and ratchet, right? If this ovary torses, it's much more likely that it's going to get caught and stuck and unable to torse back in the direction it came from if it's associated with a giant large cyst. So that's what happens in some big breath or movement. It allows the whole thing to torse. And then once it does, that giant cyst just sticks in place and doesn't let it untorse. So you can see you've got a uh, a enlarged and with peripheralized follicles ovary. It's a little tough to see. Uh, the resolution is not great on this, but you can see, especially on the posterior aspect, there are a couple of peripheralized follicles there telling you you're looking at ovary. And then there is this giant cyst, which seals the deal as far as I'm concerned. So don't forget, you can always track ovarian vessels right? And they will lead you right to the ovary as well. That can be another helpful way to find the gonads. There is the torsed ovary and that giant associated cyst. So this is obviously one that went to the anterior aspect of the abdomen. And again, that cyst predisposes you to torsion. Another interesting thing is you will see these in pregnancy. Uh, because as the uterus enlarges in pregnancy, it makes that much less room for the ovary to untorse once torsed, and it's kind of a similar situation uh, to the presence of a large cyst. And of course, one of my favorite ovarian torsion cases was a pregnant woman with a large ovarian cyst. Oh, one other thing. Sometimes these patients will present with hemorrhage in that cyst because when this becomes ischemic the whole kit and caboodle becomes ischemic right not just the ovary but also the cyst that is associated with it and so when it becomes ischemic that cyst can hemorrhage and that can be the initial presentation so my pregnant patient who had ovarian torsion and a large cyst she came in with acute hemorrhage in that cyst and we initially just looked with ultrasound and the thing was up against the uh, anterior abdominal wall and our ultrasonographer could not find the ovary itself, but she called it a hemorrhagic cyst. And since there was uncertainty, we went on to do an MR and ultimately did find the toast torsed ovary. So presentation with hemorrhage in a cyst, uh, when you find that hemorrhagic cyst, don't stop looking. In fact, think, hmm, could this be a torsed ovary? with a hemorrhagic cyst.